Well, hello, and welcome back to the Lamp Post Listener. My name is Daniel. I'm Phil. And this is a podcast where we journey chapter by chapter through C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. This is chapter 10 of The Magician's Nephew, The First Joke, and Other Matters. And we have a special guest. We do. We are welcoming returning champion Sarah Cozart back to the show. She not only is our correspondent on any kind of animal theology for the Lamp Post listener, but Sarah is a writer from College Station in Texas. She's originally from Virginia, which is where we are. Sarah is working on a book about how animals lead us to worship and wonder using the writings of C.S. Lewis as a guide. She lives with her six-year-old son, Blaze, and ridiculous dog, Luthien, who sadly had to be banished to record this podcast. Otherwise, she would have barked the whole time and demanded everyone's attention. The dog, not the child, child or Sarah. That We're talking about the dog barking. So, Sarah, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that great little, I don't think it, uh, anyone will care that you'll care, but thank you for the great little intro you've written there. I love that. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. But welcome back. Thank you so much. It's fun to be back. I think that it's good that you're here for this one because there are so many creatures. This might be the highest concentration of beasts and creatures in any chapter. Yeah, I, this was not an accident that we invited Sarah on for this, this yes, episode. Yeah. No, I know. Okay. I thought Phil was just thinking, it hey, just worked out really well, because you actually don't always know what we're covering. No, I, I, knew, I knew for this you one. You knew this one. There yes. was probably going to be some talking beasts here. Yes. So, Sarah, you have a lot of experience. Uh, with You and Phil both are both animal people. I'm not an animal person. So I, I, I don't have a pet, and I kind of never want a pet. I know that that, like... A bunch of our listeners don't like me anymore. I love other people's cats and dogs. Yeah, you're very respectful. And I like other people's pets, but I don't want to take care of one myself. Their paws. I, yeah, I always come in. I get down. I uh, on my knees. I I shake Sailor's paw. No matter what, he's, even if he's asleep, I wake him up to come greet me. Shake his paw, but I don't want him to live in my house. He no has offense. never stayed asleep while you've come over. No, <laughs> or yeah, anyone, not at all. So you have Sailor, Sarah. You have Luthien. At your house, do you want to tell us? I thought it'd just actually be fun to tell us a little bit. We're going to talk a lot about beasts. Tell us a little bit about your dog. Um, so she is two and a half, well, almost three. Um, okay. she actually, so my previous dog was Baron, B E R E N. Uh -huh. Um, and so Tolkien nerds will know that Baron and Luthien were okay. Now, I don't know this. Were they married or were they just in love no, in they, the they, Silmarillion? They, no, they get they get married by him. They get, they get permission married. from okay. Fingal, who is Lucian's okay. father. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so when we knew that we were going to get a second dog after Baron died, we knew we wanted to get a female Australian Shepherd, and that obviously her name would be Luthien. And it turned uh -huh. out Baron died November fifth, twenty nineteen, and Luthien was born November first, twenty nineteen. So she was actually alive for four days, and so I kind of think. This is very like woo woo, but I kind of think Baron kind of like passed us off to her because they were both alive for a few days. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't get her until literally the day that the pandemic shut everything down, March 15th, 2020. Oh, man. Um, of course, we didn't know that that's what was going to happen. I mean, we started to know. Um, but the very next day was when like that, the next day was a Monday and everything shut down. So yeah. she was four months old. Um, we immediately got COVID. Um, but it was back when they wouldn't test you unless you were dying. Yeah, so yeah. we didn't officially get it, you know, but we got it. Um, and then I had all sorts of health stuff. I had surgery that summer. So I basically just didn't leave the house for mm -hmm. six months. And she really liked that. And she would fall asleep like in my lap and she would like put her head oh. on my chest as she's like, Starting out at like 25 pounds, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> Starting out at 25 pounds? No, no, no. I mean, like when we got her, when she was. Oh, oh, oh. she was born <laughs> at 25 pounds. She's she, very big dog. She was She's a baby elephant. elephant. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think she was, she was 25 or 30 pounds when we got her. Um, but yeah, she's 50 pounds now. She is full grown okay. and she was a little, um, I could have done more training with her okay. <laughs> while I was at home. Um, and I mean, she would do things like she just wants my attention all mm -hmm. the time. She's obsessed with me, which is really sweet, um, but also really exhausting. Um, and she if I was um, I did a lot of tutoring over Zoom, especially when we were 
on lockdown and I had to put her away every time because she'd be mm. like, oh, ooh, who are you talking to? I want to talk to that person. Actually, I just want to talk to you and I don't want you to talk to anyone but me. So she, that was a little bit much. So we sent her to training camp a couple of months ago and she has now gotten a lot better. She's a lot more respectful. She does not tackle Blaze, my six-year-old anymore. She now just jumps up and gently licks his face. Oh, good. Oh, that's great. Um, do, you, do you get a certificate from obedience <sighs> school? Well, I'm sure you do, but I don't think we're totally done because oh, we I was still say, have I'm sure some, you do, like... but we didn't pass. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. There's we still have a couple of group lessons to go to, okay. but after it was over, I after her like intense time was mm-hmm. over, I got COVID. So I've been stuck yeah. at home. So yeah. So if my voice ever sounds weird, I know they said they're gonna edit it out, but sometimes when I try not to cough, it's this weird like Ugh, kind yeah, of sound. Yeah. So yeah. listeners, I apologize. <laughs> That's, we're I, glad you could be here and are pushing through. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. Yeah, I'm. This is the first sort of normal thing I've done in the last two weeks. So, well, good. I, that's the first time anyone's ever called what we do here on this show normal. So we <laughs> really appreciate that. Other than sitting in my bed and reading a book, let's yes, put it that fair way. enough. Fair enough. Right. <laughs> well, Phil, do you tell us a little bit? I just think it'd be a, a fun thing to do because so much of what we're doing today is talking about dominion and animals. Tell, you just want to t- tell us a little bit about the sailor. Well, to, he yeah. is a, a 92 pound black lab, just got back from the vet, no diseases. Okay. Came back negative for everything. Do um, you like regular, so again, I don't have pets. So I don't know. Do you like usually take a dog to get checked for diseases? Is that like a normal thing? We take him to his yearly checkup. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he has dog insurance. So everything really? is covered. And no. do you anal- yeah. oh, oh, I was like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how it works. Yeah. It's a, it's much better than the insurance that we have here. It's just okay. universal. Um, no. It is, um, it's really fun to have him because I feel like a dog forces you to be a better person because you have to go for a walk. You have to go out and see your neighbors or that dog is going to go nuts. And it also keeps you on a schedule. You got to get up you got to get breakfast started. You feed them around the same time, same for dinner. Um, and they're just always there. I, so I work from home and my dog follows me to every single room. And if I'm upstairs and then I go down to get a snack, he comes with me and he, it's like having a Pokemon. <laughs> okay. And I, I, re- I really like it. That's great. I love and, that. Uh, he also, you start to see personality. So like he'll, he'll have an attitude about certain things. Mm-hmm. He has different moods throughout the day. It's really great. See, I don't think I've been around someone's dog enough to see, like I've been around Sailor a lot, but maybe not enough to see personality as much. And I, I'm sure that, I, I mean, I know that dogs and animals do, but I don't spend enough time around them. Yeah. We, we got a dog. My family did when I was 17. So like, I literally, it was either the end of my junior year yeah. and my senior year, I was so busy and it was my sister's dog. Um, it was kind of weird because that dog replaced you. It did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. they were like, Daniel's <laughs> leaving soon. Let's get something else Let's here. Let's get something else high energy. Yeah. yeah. So I know, I, I mean, I like that Ravenous. dog a lot, but his name was Kipper, but I just did not spend a lot of time really getting to know him. Cause I was like, I was your senior in high school. The, like I, I should have spent more time at home, but I was always hanging out with friends or doing school stuff or out and about. So we just didn't really, and he slept in my sister's room and kind of hated me. So that also might've been why we, <laughs> We didn't spend much time together. So I didn't really know much of his personality, unfortunately. Yeah. But I will say, I know this will upset both of y'all probably, but if we did, my Anna is allergic to dogs and cats and pretty oh. much every animal, which is why we don't have any. So you'd probably get like a miniature giraffe or something. If we, yeah, we, we're probably going to get a giraffe <laughs> in the backyard. Um, like in those direct TV commercials. Yes. Yeah. If if we did ever get a pet, I would 100% get a cat. I like cats. Oh, gosh. Books way more of a cat person i love cats okay Um, cool cool and i had a cat growing up that um was a barn cat that i not rescued i was gonna i was gonna take it home anyway and she was they were gonna be well taken care of but the mama cat put her this is at a horse farm she put her babies inside a little hole in a stump in the horse pasture She put them in a stump in the horse pasture, which means that as they're like three or four weeks old, they're starting to climb out of the stump. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, three inches long or whatever. And the horses are walking around. So we went and took them out of the stump and put them in an extra stall so they wouldn't all get trampled to death. And the first cat that I pulled out was the one that three weeks later I ended up taking home. And we first named her Gracie. And then that devolved into Kitty. 
and she has been Kitty ever since. And she lived until she was 19 and wow. kept, my, kept my parents company after I went to college and moved away and mm-hmm. stayed with them until 2015. So, wow. That's um, a long cat. yeah, so I love cats and I'm hoping to get one eventually, but I think we have to, we've got a little bit more calming down for Luthien to do before I'm ready for her to like introduce another variable. Yeah. To chase and bark at (laughs) Mm -hmm. is with, with cats. It feels like from my limited experience, you can kind of just rename them anytime you want, right? Like nobody, like my sister has two cats, uh, Aragorn and Eowyn and when she adopted them, they totally had like other names. And I, she just was like, nope, just change them. I don't care. Like they were like older, like they're like four years old, <laughs> like old enough that they, they had well-established names. She's like, nah, don't care. But I feel like you, you don't really do that with dogs. Am I incorrect? Is that, is that normal or no? Again, I don't know pet culture. I've only heard it with cats. Yeah. With dogs, it's kind of like, hey, this is the dog you adopted. You're stuck with the name. Yeah, we didn't name him Sailor. That was his name. That his parents gave to him. Yeah. <laughs> his parents, yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I've, I've definitely seen friends who have adopted non-puppies who have changed the name because, like, the sometimes the shelters or whoever okay. give them just really stupid names, and they're <laughs> like, I just can't be associated with this my entire life. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, Actually, I think it's my, the once you have them and changing it that is so like interesting. If, if you're in the process of adopting them, change it then. Don't have them for, like, a year or two and be like, you know what? That just feels more like a Robert to me. So we're just going to change it right now. I, by the way, I really think that all pets should have just very, very human names. I would 100% if we ever had like a dog, just be like, this Jonathan. Yeah, the Christopher. Dog. Wallace. No, Christopher the dog. <laughs> you know, I love it. What were you saying this, Sarah? Um, I was going to say, well, first of all, that's what we did with my cat. Uh, we okay. kind of changed her name to yeah, Kitty, yeah. but because we just kept calling her that. But um, my best friend from high school had a dog that for a while that she named Shasta, of course, from okay. the horse and his boy. And it was a boy. And everyone was like, oh, what a pretty name for a girl dog. She was like, how dare you? Uh, <laughs> because they didn't know the Chronicles of know. Narnia. Mm-mm. Yeah. Did she change it to Ervis? Like, what did she decide to do? <laughs> no, actually, this fits with what you were talking about. She had she had rescued him and she called him Shasta and he had a different name before and he just did not take to being called Shasta and would not come when called. So she had to go back to whatever she lame name. Back, yeah. yeah, she did. So that was kind of sad. Interesting. I think that's the wah, other piece wah. is that a dog may not figure out the new name and a cat isn't going to figure it out, anyways. but it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't care. The cat, the cat's not coming in. Yeah, anyway. he'll be there when he wants. <laughs> that's, to. that's great. That's true. All right. Well, speaking of all these animals, we have there's a lot of naming that takes place here. There's a lot of discussion over the roles that animals have here in chapter ten. Phil, you have the chapter summary for us. Will you go ahead and read that? I would love to. Beasts and birds emerge from the wood and join the animals already gathered around Aslan. The lion gives them Narnia, and places them in charge of the non-talking creatures of the land. In response, a jackdaw speaks a bit loudly, and his timing draws quite a bit of attention to himself. When everyone laughs, he becomes the first joke in the new world. Aslan begins to walk away, and Diggory, hoping to get some help for his dying mother, follows along. The creatures nearby notice the humans and seem confused by their presence until the cabbie's horse begins to remember life before being woken up and after some discussion agrees to take Diggory to Aslan. Meanwhile, convinced that he may be the Meevil that entered their world, hmm. the rest of the animals chase Uncle Andrew around. Nice! That's great. I love that you got Meevil in there, which actually I want to spend quite a bit of time talking about today. Yes. Yeah. What is Meevil? We're going to get there. And actually, it's Lewis making his own joke that for word nerds, I think people might find it really interesting. He's actually doing something more than just making like a silly pun. Cool. Yeah. Well, I look forward to that even more now. Well, let's first start with the literal elephant in the room. <laughs> I think, is there an elephant at this point? I think we hear, hear about one, right? Maybe it's the end of last chapter. Yeah, but at the end of last chapter. At the end of last it, chapter. So at the end of the last chapter, Aslan separated these two animals. And here at the very beginning of this chapter, he explains to them that the dumb beasts, the ones who can't talk, are yours. He says that to the talking beast. And there's a lot of questions here as to 
to what is going on. And the kind of first big question I have for us to, to discuss from last chapter into this chapter is, what is Aslan doing? <laughs> Why is he separating these animals? Does this have something to do with an, some kind of hierarchy that exists? Why do they exist simultaneously? Why not just make all the animals talking animals or keep all of them as dumb beasts? What's happening here? Um, they're kind of an interesting in-between category, like you okay. said. Um, <clears throat> and we can talk in a little bit about the connections between um, the supposal that Lewis is giving mm -hmm. and the creation account that he is giving of Narnia and then how that connects to <clears throat> the way that God laid a call to dominion on Adam and Eve. Um, but I think what's interesting is um, they, I think they have the same place that animals do in our world. So they, the dumbies are to be cared for and stewarded and husbanded in the sense of mm -hmm. animal husbandry, um, sometimes used as food. Cause we know that from other books that um, they're allowed to kill dumbies. They're allowed to shoot, you know, a dumb squirrel or eat that bear in Prince Caspian that ended up mm -hmm. being a, a wild bear. Um, but they're never to be tortured or killed unnecessarily just as we would never you know, on purpose, torture an animal. Um, and then talking beasts hold the place that humans do in our world. So it's really, I think, the humans in Narnia that are kind of in a weird position. They are yeah. sort of in between the position of humans in our world and the position of God in our world. They're this sort of vice regent uh, Ooh, well said, kind of yeah. person. Um, and also, I mean, we know that from the end of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, that Aslan is how he appears in the world of Narnia, but he's also saying basically that he is Jesus or God as mm -hmm. they would come to know him in their world. So in one sense, he did create the humans, but he didn't create them when he created Narnia. They came oh, from yeah, that's, yeah. They came from elsewhere. Now that is not an original thought to me. Um, there's, uh, I have a friend on Twitter named Daniel White, who is also working on, um, he does, he's doing some research on Narnia. And um, if y'all, all you can put it in the show notes to follow him, because he's also published a bunch of really good articles. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, specifically, most recently about Corin, um, and a few articles about the horse and his boy that I think your readers would really enjoy, your listeners would enjoy. Um, but yeah, he was the one who pointed out that Aslan didn't create humans when he created Narnia. So I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. So they do kind of come in as this extra, extra piece. Um, but then we have this thing, and I'm going to bring in from Paralandra and also from that hideous Please do. It's not, That's always great. It's not a spoiler, <laughs> but it's... Phil's never going to read them anyways, unless unless we do it on the show eventually. But read. I gave you all three of those books, and you have You not. did not give me all three. You gave me one, and I did read the entire thing. Oh, did I not give you Pearl Lantern and that hideous string? No. I guess I know what you're getting for Christmas this year. <laughs> I guess I just <laughs> I, thought I, I look forward to opening all... that in two years. I get ha ha ha. I thought I'd give you all three. I'm sorry. My <laughs> mistake. I apologize now. Don't hold me against it. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> Don't hold me against it. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's one point where the protagonist in Paralandra learns from the unfallen and sort of Adam figure in Paralandra that eventually in that world that the king and queen will quote make the nobler of the beasts so wise that they will become and now I don't know how to pronounce this H-N-A-U I've always just sort of said now but I'm sure that's not how Lewis wanted it to be said that's how I've always pronounced it but we could both be wrong who knows it, it basically means rational that they will become now and speak their lives shall awake to new life in us as we awake in Mal Eldil which is the god figure god. Mm -hmm. um and then also in that hideous strength as he comes back from Paralandra it's said at some point that he regains or he has gotten from Paralandra man's quote, man's lost prerogative to end noble beasts. Um, and so I think Lewis is suggesting that in an ideal world, humans in our world would enact godly rule over creation, serving and caring for the creatures and cultivating and protecting the land and the resources. And even to the point of leading some animals into closer communion with God, which would be the purpose of rationality. And so 
I think that Lewis's idea of if the what what would it be like if the world had not fallen? He gets to do that supposal in Perlandra, and then Narnia doesn't fall in the same way because it's not necessarily the the original inhabitants of Narnia that are the mm-hmm. problem. It's the navel that was brought in <laughs> to Narnia. Um, but I think he wants the talking beasts and the dumb beasts to have the same interaction that ideally humans and animals would have in an unfallen world in our world. So that's how I see that relationship. Wow. That's really cool. I didn't even think about the, the fact that that could be the like unbroken version or like we would get a glimpse of that. That's really cool. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to think about, you know, in this supposal, what that means for humans, because if talking beasts are created there at the beginning, which we see, you know, they're created at the start of Narnia. It is very much fully theirs. Aslan even says, I give myself to you. He's talking to talking beasts. He is not speaking to the humans at that point. And he's saying, you have dominion uh, over them, kind of like Genesis chapter six, or uh, chapter one, I mean, on the sixth day kind of of creation. You have this this very clear dominion, but then, and, and you can kind of see the almost one-to-one, dare I say it, allegory that's taking place until you're like, oh, and then there's these humans here who were technically created by Aslan in another world at a different time and then magic themselves <laughs> into here and are now witnessing all of that. And it does make for this interesting hierarchy that we know is to come through the appointment of of royalty that's over the talking beast, which we don't really have anything that kind of works like that in our world even when god like in the old testament you know creates a king like saul as the first king is not a like he's not he's he's a human just like the rest of the israelites you know i think that and that actually brings it to another point i've been thinking about i wonder if this also could be viewed this kind of splitting of the talking and dumb beast um we talked in the last episode about how it how it's not predestination lewis is not a calvinist um that would not be a great reading of that as much as we love our presbyterian brothers and sisters um we will it it could though be looked at as kind of this um god's chosen people like of israel like we see that in the Old Testament, that there's kind of a people set apart. Uh, now God doesn't go around saying, "Well, y'all are my chosen people, and these are the dumb people <laughs> over here." Um, although they do sometimes act like that. Although the Israelites spend a, a fair amount of their time acting like that as well, too. But there is kind of a, a people set apart by God. So I think there's a little bit of that as well, too. But I think you you make a great point of this kind of mirroring what human to animal interaction should look like in kind of a pre-fallen world. I love. And part of what I appreciate so much about Lewis's work is it's not a one-to-one. It's oh, yeah, not a direct yeah. allegory. It's not a, this is this, this is this. He pulls elements and then pieces them together and creates something completely new. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I have this quote from The Problem of Pain, which when I first shared this quote, it was to share the inspiration for the book that I started writing three years ago, which I'm still working on. Um, but at this hey, point, it's it, actually... Hey, hey, it took Tolkien <laughs> like 20 years to write Lord of the Rings. So you're writing the next great, you know, I am writing no Lord of, our... of the Rings. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Don't put that on me. Oh, my goodness. Um, but um, it's actually, it, it fits really well. So at one point in The Problem of Pain, he's describing what he calls paradisal man. And he has this interesting idea because he he isn't necessarily referring to Adam in this point. He's referring to unfallen man as sort of a general category. Um, so he, here's how he describes him. He says, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, commanding himself. He commanded all lower lives with which he came into contact. Even now we meet the rare individuals who have a mysterious power of taming beasts. This power, the paradisal man enjoyed in eminence. The old picture of the brutes sporting before before Adam and fawning upon him may not be wholly symbolical. Even now, more animals than you might expect are ready to adore man if they are given a reasonable opportunity. For man was made to be the priest and even, in one sense, the Christ of the animals, the mediator through whom they apprehended so much of the divine splendor as their irrational nature allows. And I think that's 
there's several things going on there. But I think as far as Narnia goes, um, the talking beasts are there in a sense to image Aslan to the non-talking beasts, to the dumb mm-hmm. beasts, because the dumb beasts don't have a relationship with Aslan, but the talking beasts do. Um, kind of goes into our idea about the image of God. There are a whole bunch of things we could say about that. But um, if our vocation is to image God, a huge part of that is communicating that to the rest of the world and mm-hmm. including nature, not just other humans. And so I think it's so interesting because if we are to have right dominion in our world, if the rivers could speak to us, if the trees could say, hey, 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 no, this is messing up our forest ecosystem. We need to do this in a different way. The way that the river gods or the dryads or the naiads, you know, they embody the trees mm-hmm. and the, the river and everything. If, if we could have that kind of communication from our environment, how would that change how we would interact with it? And so I, I think it's, that's just kind of an aside. I think it's so interesting that he creates also the spirits of the forest and the trees and everything, and he makes them communicate Um, but as far as the, that quote, it's that I think the talking beasts are to, like I said, image Aslan to the dumb beasts and they made the dumb beasts may not be able to really even understand. I mean, how much can my dog understand of God? But if I beat her all day and she only, she knows me as sort of the ultimate, not power, but the ultimate sense of like who she cares about, what is she going to know about the world other than it is a cruel place you know um and if i am kind to her and i tend to her needs and i also train her and help her to be the best beast that she can be then what she will know about the world is an orderly place where she knows her place and she is happy and she is well cared for and there's some sense i think in which they can understand i don't know how much they can understand but there's something there's something there i think well yeah and and even to just continue that that thought you know we're able to kind of get it's the same way with like being an obviously you know uh pets or animals not the same thing as kids but i I know you can relate to this too as a parent i think there's that some of that and this is for anyone else who's a parent this almost sounds cliche because we all know it to be true even if you're not a parent you've heard this many times i mean how much more of an understanding do we get, uh, a better sometimes of an understanding do we get of God's love towards us than our love to our own kids. And in that way that we're kind of imaging God, right? We're not God, but we are taking on on, uh, some kind of authoritative role with this agape love towards our children. And that can, the similar kind of thing can be said towards pets. No, they're not our, you know, they're not our blood. And, but that's not even true of all parents. If if you have a a child who's adopted or a foster child or any kind of, um, and you still can have that kind of love towards something that on, on, I know that, you know, we live in a world often that, that doesn't like the idea of, of hierarchy, but there still are hierarchies. Like in my house, my, I'm above my child. In in Phil's house, he is above his dog. Like that's just a legitimate thing for good Appreciate reason. That. Like this house would not be great. We're recording in Phil's house. This house would not be a great place if Sailor ran the show. There would be a few things done differently. That's yeah, for sure. it's, it's, and they probably mostly wouldn't be for the best, even for Sailor's own good part. In the same way, that like my son, if he could choose right now, He'd be like, we're only eating cheese all day long. He's also allergic to eggs, but he likes them. And we're only eating eggs, like cheese and eggs. And I'm going to throw up every single day. But that's what makes me happy. You know, oh, and he would run down. the. He would try to jump down all the stairs. But that's not a good way to live. And so I have a place of authority over him, right, where I am setting some guardrails. There's actually literal guardrails on our stairs so that he cannot jump down there, right? (laughs) Um, And it's a similar thing. Like, I get a little bit better of an idea of how God does that to me, of the fact that God sets guardrails, God sets rules, if you will, right, to actually make my life better because if I was fully in charge of it doing whatever it is I want to do, it actually wouldn't be in my best interest, even if I don't realize that. And so by in God giving us dominion, whether it's animals, whether it's children, right? But let's look at animals here. And God giving us dominion, we're actually able to get a better understanding of ourselves of what it means to lovingly uh, hold authority over something in a loving way. Like you said, you're not going to beat your dog. You're not going to abuse that power. And we often see that happen in all kinds of uses of authority. But godly authority is good authority. It's not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. And we get a better picture of that through dominion over animals. When we're talking about 
the kind of dominion we take, that word has gotten skewed so many times. And it's so close to the word dominate that we tend to think that the dominion mandate means we can do whatever the heck we want to with this earth that God gave us. Mm -hmm. But who are we supposed to follow in how to take care of the earth? And that is Christ. And I think that's what's so helpful is if we can think about Christ or Aslan, um, how did he rule? Did he rule with an iron fist? No, of course not. Did he do anything but serve? That's how we're supposed to take dominion over this world. And there may be times when we have to exert our will and, you know, not let my dog just stick her head in the food bowl for 30 minutes and eat her fill until she explodes. But I'm doing it to serve her. I am not doing it ultimately only for my enjoyment, although it is okay, I think, for us to enjoy our pets, to have pets for the sake Mm -hmm. of enjoyment. But it's not only that. It is ultimately the, 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 um, the model that we follow when we are enacting dominion over the earth is Christ's model. And I think if we keep that in front of us, it makes it a lot easier to not fall into the pitfalls of people who take dominion in the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is so key. Um, it's hard to explain. We, we have so many examples of leadership of poor leadership in our, in our culture, but leadership is a burden and you have, you, it really does need to be from a, a servant's heart that you're approaching matters. Um, when you were talking about how your dog would eat until she exploded, when I have a new bag of food and I pour it into the plastic container that we keep it in, my dog will come over and treat it like a, a fountain of food and tilt his head. And, <laughs> try to, try to, and I'm like, you have no self-control. Like I'm, I'm setting you up to be fed every day for the next 60 days and you're just knocking it all over the floor. <laughs> And because you want to have all of it right now. Wait, do you pour the like the bag is for sixty days? Yeah, you don't you don't view all your food as in portion days. No, I don't. I just <laughs> but that's how that's a, it's like a big bag of food. It's a big bag of food. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it might be thirty days. I'm sure yeah. it is. Well, let's let's keep going because uh, at least here on my Kindle, we're on page one still. So <laughs> this is great though. As the, all of this is happening. Um, Aslan gives this command and then the joke takes place. Oh, we do learn really quick that Strawberry also can talk, which is really fun. But there's going to be more of that conversation later. So as this happens, we hear the first joke, which is that a jackdaw says no fear when everyone else has become quiet. So cringe humor seems to be the first yes. type of humor first, that makes the first it example of cringe humor <laughs> yes years makes before it the office into narnia i'm gonna be honest i have never whenever i've read this book never really found this part to be very funny now don't get we're not gonna get to what aslan says because that part is hilarious but why do all of the animals la- are they like awkwardly laughing because they all say no aslan we won't we won't and then the jackdaw's like no fear <laughs> and Everyone laughs. You're laughing right now. Ah, fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that it's the the fact that he didn't mean to be the only one talking at that. Okay. Time. Yeah, I don't think it's the words. I don't think it's the meaning of what he said. Um, and I've shared this before, and I've got permission to share this. But years ago, when I was a kid, we were, it was Christmas time. We were singing uh, carols at church. And uh, we were about to start singing Joy to the World. And my dad came in like a couple measures early because of the way he heard the piano coming in. He thought it was time to start. And so he goes, Joy! <laughs> and, and nobody else is <laughs> oh, <no>. doing <laughs> and, and everyone laughed. And he was basically was like, I'll put my head under my wing now if yeah, he was the yeah. jackdaw. <laughs> but it was funny, not because the word joy is that funny, but because it was like, in the middle of you know silence and so that's yes. what i always think of that makes that makes sense when yeah. i hear this it's part. like it's like sitting in church or standing in church and like you think that you're singing you you come in at the wrong time or something exactly like that and you're just like i'm just gonna sit down now yeah. I, I can't <laughs> or leave yeah <laughs> I, just, I walk out by every that church in the wrong or do the wrong verse in a hymn i'm like i'm just gonna leave now I'll be but back then everyone Sunday. watches you walk out that's the I problem sit in the back for, i already sit in the back because of my son so <laughs> <laughs> We're already ready to walk out. For just such occasions. 
<laughs> no, our church is very supportive of of, of noisy children. But... I will say, I did I did read read this paragraph <laughs> twice. Yeah. To make sure that I didn't miss some joke or some play on words. But then once I continued, then I saw that it's yeah. Aslan saying that, no, well, <laughs> you're the joke. Which is great. Yeah. It's such a great burn so from really Aslan. It's Aslan that makes the first joke. He's like, no, 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 you're the jerk. Or the joke, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't call it, call them a jerk. He's very nice, very sweet. So all of this happens. And I wanted to talk a little bit about laughing in paradise. So two things I wanted to bring up today, both come from Marvin Hinton who we've gone to many times, wrote the keys to the Chronicles. And he actually made a connection to a little book. A lot of us have actually, technically it's a poem called Dante's, in, well, actually we're going to go to paradise. So paradiso, if my Italian is correct. And he actually talked about, there's this part in paradiso. So just as a reminder for everybody, um, you have Inferno, you have Purgatorio. Again, my Italian's not very good. And then paradiso. So in the third part of Dante's Divine Comedy, Dante goes with Beatrice, and they're going through heaven. And it's while they're in paradise, he actually comes across, um, he comes across Pope Gregory, uh, Gregory the Great. And in this, I just want to read two sentences that Marvin Hinton wrote, and then eventually he's going to actually quote Dante. He says, upon entering heaven, Pope Gregory discovered that he had been mistaken on a point of theology. Lewis told a friend that he approved of Gregory's response. And this is what Dante has Gregory write. But hardly had he wakened in this heaven than he had moved to laugh at his own delusions. And this goes great with what happens after Aslan kind of teases the, the jackdaw, says, you were the first joke. It's not like the, the, the jackdaw's like, oh, I just got owned by, by the king of the world. He's laughs too. He's like, oh, that, that was a good one. That was a good one, Aslan. Kind of laughing all together. We're... He is the joke. He's the butt of the joke, if you will. But everyone is laughing with him, not at him. And it is this view of comedy that we really don't get often. Like, if someone is the butt of a joke, you're usually laughing at them, not with them in that kind of setting. And yet everyone's laughing alongside with the jackdaw. And that's what we see um, in in Paradise, right? In in the Divine Comedy is, is Gregory, like, realizing, oh, my goodness, I was wrong about some piece of, the, piece of theology and just laughs about it. I'm in Paradise now. It doesn't matter anymore, right? right. Um, and, and I think that's a great connection. I think things do hurt, and they are sinister and mean when things are not perfect. Like when we make fun of you. Right. It hurts so much. It does. No, actually, quite the opposite. Because we're... <laughs> it doesn't hurt, so we can just tease you all along. <laughs> right. Because we're fine, because we have that friendship established... Everything just kind of bounces off. Like mm -hmm. it, you don't even notice yeah. some of the stuff sometimes. It's it's like there's if if like my wife and I are teasing each other, right, about something that like if someone else made some of those jokes, it would maybe legitimately hurt my feelings. But I'm like I know that my wife loves me unconditionally, right? And so unless it's like in the middle of a fight, not that we ever ever fight, uh, but if it's in the middle of some kind of like arguments, like, oh, that one kind of stings. But if it's like, hey, I'm teasing you because, and I love you, it's just part of the way we communicate. I know it's like, oh, that's funny. Like that yeah. is true. And I trust her in that in the same way that like Phil and I, I always make fun of Phil before we record. I just sit here and tease him the entire time before we hit record. It's very humbling. Yeah. But if it yeah. came from someone else just across the street here, it might hurt a little bit right. more. But then there's actually a legitimate joke by Lewis, which is that some of the animals are called off to a council, right? Some of the animals remain remain behind, and they're the cabbiest there, who we can just call Frank. His name is Frank Phil. You're going to find out that later on. I don't feel like calling him the cabbie anymore. Frank is there with, uh, with Diggory and with Polly, and they're kind of overhearing the rest of the animals speaking. And in this conversation, the animals are concerned that uh, Aslan said something about uh, a nevil, has entered the world. That's N E E V I L. What Aslan had really said was an evil, A N space E V I L. And they're taking it as A space N E E V I L. Very confused. They even think the humans are this. But I wanted to go back to Hinton just for a second because now I did not, again, not my thoughts here. These are Hinton's thoughts. He pointed out that this is a linguistic joke that Lewis is making here. Were you all aware of this at all? Not, not since your preview. Okay, great. So, so here is what 
Here's what Marvin Hinton writes here in the book, and we'll put it in the episode's description. Definitely pick it up. You don't need to listen to our podcast. You can just read the book. It's only like 100 pages. Uh, save you a lot more time than listening to one hour of us every two <laughs> weeks. The Keys to the Chronicles. It's called Unlocking the Symbols of C.S. Lewis's Narnia. Here's what he writes uh, about this little scene here. He says, Lewis playfully presents this as a Narnian instance of a linguistic phenomenon he was familiar with from English, the moving of a letter from the end of one word to the start of another, or vice versa. This most commonly occurs with the letter N in English. For instance, the old English word for snake was a nadir. That's A space N-A-E-D-R-E, which has now turned into an adder, an adder. Right, because people heard the word differently. An example going the opposite way is a newt, like the animal, which originally was an oot, a n space e w t. Huh. So this is something that is often. I'm sure Lewis and Tolkien both would have been very familiar with this. Has happened often in English over the centuries, where a word, especially with the letter n, gets shifted between words. And so Lewis is making a joke that here at the very beginning of speech, you have. And what I'd like to, to think is that for a very, very long time, no one said the word evil, but they all just said the word nevil, and it's never come up in Narnia before. <laughs> but they just, that's what evil is. It's nevil. It's just yeah. nevil. Good and nevil. Yeah. Good and nevil. <laughs> so I just thought that was funny before we move on that that happens. Um, one thing that I think is really cool is that um, Aslan at one point says, when, when he's when the animals all start laughing at one point they're trying to suppress it mm -hmm. and then he says uh look, laugh and fear not friends or something like that and then he says for jokes as well as justice come with mm. speech yeah jokes and justice and i thought what what the charge that he gives to them at the very beginning of that chapter the dumb beasts whom i have not chosen are yours also treat them gently and cherish them but do not go back to their ways lest you cease to be talking beasts mm -hmm. so that's the justice part so he's basically saying, I've already taught you about justice, and that's part of your responsibility of being a talking beast. But mm -hmm. jokes also come with being a talking beast. And um, a couple years ago, um, I wrote a piece that I'm going to shamelessly quote from myself. Um, it was published in Fathom Magazine. They had the um, theme of laughter. So yeah, they have a different a great, theme yeah. every month. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote a piece about our dog Baron who had always just made us laugh a whole lot. Um, and I, I, I thought of that when I read what he said. So um, what I wrote then was laughter shared is a faithful witness to the joy to come. We don't think of heaven as the place full of laughter, but why not? Do we think that laughter is too silly, too ephemeral, too earthly for the presence of God? Perhaps, perhaps our experiences with laughter have been slightly ridden with guilt. And that's like what you guys were talking about, where mm -hmm. if there's any kind of negativity within the relationship, it's going to hurt or it's not right. going to be a, a happy situation. The off color remark or the hideous, but or, sorry, or the hilarious, but biting comment at someone else's expense. But what of the giggles that we could not contain <clears throat> when our dog briefly got his head stuck in a large Tupperware container full of goldfish crackers mm -hmm. and then tried madly to remove his head from that <laughs> container by shaking his head back and forth like, no, 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 that's not what I wanted. <laughs> and then finally the container flew off spewing yes. goldfish crackers all over the floor. And he was like, oh, food and gobbled all of them <laughs> up. So we were dying laughing then. And I want to think that Jesus was laughing along with that because mm -hmm. that is legitimately funny. It's not like there was no abuse. There was no like, I'm going to make my dog feel uncomfortable on purpose. You know, those things are funny. And God created animals to play. He created animals to play in such a way that often it tickles us. I mean, that's why cat videos are so mm -hmm. uh, popular, right? I yeah, mean, even yeah. if you don't like animals are you like Daniel don't necessarily want to have one in your home, which with allergies and dirt and everything, I understand, but we can all <laughs> think that what was that old one where the cat, it was like that song by AWOL nation. Is that how you say it? Where it's like sail. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it jumps, jumps That's off hilarious. and boom, drops straight. I mean, I feel bad <laughs> for that cat, but nobody did that to the cat on purpose. It was just the cat being clumsy, mm -hmm. but God made us have a laughter response to animals either being clumsy or playing together like we find it cute and funny when like 
a puppy is like rolling down a hill and he's like, oh man, you know, I mean, it's funny. Like we are just naturally drawn to that, which makes me think God is laughing at that. Mm -hmm. And that means that God, like if he created us that way, there's gotta be that kind of laughter in heaven. Right. Right. And I think that's kind of what Lewis is trying to say. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That that's one way that we can image God. And I love that quote jokes as well as justice come with speech, but they have to go together. If there's no justice, then the jokes are unkind. Mm -hmm. And if there's no jokes, then we're just a whole bunch of dullards and life kind of stinks. I love that. Well, uh, moving on, we have um, a conversation that takes place between Strawberry and the cabbie, Frank. So all this, as all this is happening, the um, the children and Frank start approaching. There's even this like weird exchange where some of the animals are like, wait, are you guys in evil? Like, no, I think they're cabbage. Is that what they think they are? At first, I think was that what they? Yeah, ra- yeah, like yeah large, large lettuce, lettuce. Excuse me. But then we have this interesting interaction between Frank and Strawberry. So Strawberry is the horse that came with them from London. Strawberry is a part of the talking beast. But interestingly enough, Strawberry doesn't really seem to remember Frank. In fact, it's in this conversation that some of these things start to come back. But Strawberry, when becoming a talking beast, appears to have not carried all of his memories just straight with him into... This, this new kind of form of being. In fact, he says that he was Aslan. He considers himself part of the animals that Aslan said awake to, which is an interesting verb considering, you know, he hasn't been asleep mm-hmm. physically. But it's, right? it's like a dream. But like a dream. It's almost like Neo in the Matrix where everything in London was him and then all of a sudden he Morpheus shows up and is like, hey, I got to show you something. You can talk now. Yeah, Everything in London? Well, no, but like in the 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 horse was in London. Okay, yeah. I know that I know that the Matrix doesn't take place. I was in London. Say, did you did you buy the UK version of, of the <laughs> yeah. Matrix? In the, in the UK, they have accents, and it takes place in London, <laughs> just like you did with Harry Potter. So, yeah. say philosophers. Stuff. That is true. So, what do y'all what do y'all make of the fact that Strawberry doesn't? Is there anything really happening here? Is it just some plot point Lewis decided to do? Is Lewis trying to say something? about uh this character why can strawberry not remember these things i think it's like what you said where it was a different form of being um because there are some things later well even earlier actually when the jackdaw says will everyone always be told that i made the first joke so he has some kind of historical understanding that they're at the beginning of something yeah that's true But he also just learned how to use his wings because he was just getting used to them. They were still Mm -hmm, new to him. mm -hmm. And then there's the part where the rabbit says they're kind of large lettuce, but they've not had a chance to eat any lettuce. And so, I mean, but at the same time, we can think that God created Adam as an adult man, not as a baby. Mm -hmm. And these animals are created as adult animals, not as babies. And so there's got to be some kind of understanding of the world that Aslan gave them. Um, just as animals, just because he created them as adults instead of just a bunch of, you know, puppies and lambs and baby goats, kids, um, all, all over the place. But so they had some kind of animal instinct, I guess, before, but they didn't necessarily have the sentience that they have mm-hmm. now. And so F- Strawberry just has more of that because he has the animal instinct of an entire lifetime, not yeah. of just like 30 minutes of having been a dumb beast <laughs> that pop- popped out of the ground. And then as uh, Frank and Diggory talk to him, he starts to remember more things. So that's the only thing I can think of is that it's yeah. this sort of well, shadowy, yeah, yeah, yeah. shadowy past kind of situation. Uh, um, I know that computers weren't around the same way they are now, but it seems like it was a, a pretty hard reset for this horse where <laughs> this is like a new level. And I also feel like the horse is kind of coming back online where they they seem to have some hint of something and the more they think about it the more they can kind of piece it together but true. maybe they're just getting used to being conscious and being aware that yeah. they're aware of something yeah it's interesting how their memory works and like you just said Sarah about you know the jackdaw knowing that they're at the beginning of something that they know what cabbage is somehow or lettuce I already just I just said it wrong last time too uh but again, they've, they're new. It's like, do they have memories? What does that look like? I mean, we could even go back to, to Genesis 1. It's like, or yeah, Genesis 1 and through 3 and be like, what is it like for Adam who's not born as a 
baby? Does he have memories as of a child? Does he not? I mean, that's stuff that the Bible is not very interested in answering. That's not the focus of those those chapters. But just interesting to think about. Like, wow, that's a uh, that feels like a Star Trek episode, you know, like <laughs> implanting memories into something that doesn't have them. Yeah. Well, as all of this continues, um, Strawberry eventually um, allows Diggory to ride on his back. Diggory wants to go talk to Aslan about something that could maybe help save his mother. And Frank and Polly follow him, and then they're gone for the rest of the chapter. And it's then that Lewis, as the narrator, turns us back to Uncle Andrew. And we have a, a pretty interesting revelation that he has been completely ignorant to this entire scene. He's understood absolutely none of it. In fact, Lewis says, for what you see in here depends a good deal on where you are standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. And we learn that Uncle Andrew has only heard animal noises this entire time. And it's by choice. He, he didn't want to hear any of it. And he understood less and less until it got to a point where he can no longer even if he wanted to, he could no longer understand. Exactly. It. And Lewis even goes on to say that really famous line from the book where he says, now the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you very often succeed. And then he follows it with Uncle Andrew did. Uncle Andrew did. Yeah. <laughs> and all of this is like, it was a choice. Like Uncle Andrew has closed himself off to the beauty, the majesty, all of the truth in front of him, the good, the true, and the beautiful that he can see, he shuts himself down to that by choice. He chooses that because it's easier than believing that what he's seeing in front of them is all these animals talking. And I, I wonder if it is always a choice for him or if eventually he just makes that choice enough that, like Lewis says, he just becomes stupider and no longer has the ability to even understand what's happening. Right. And in this land, it, it could very well be both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it says um, a little bit farther on than where you are now. Um, when after the animals animals surround him, they're just curious, and they're they're just their mouths are open because they've been running and they're panting, but he thinks they're about to eat him. <clears throat> it said he had never liked animals at the best of times, being usually rather afraid of them. And of course, years of doing cruel experiments on animals had made him hate and fear them far more. So it's a really strong contrast between how he responds to the animals, mm -hmm. which is just fear and hate, which are because he never took right dominion or servant dominion over animals in mm -hmm. his own life, torturing guinea pigs. You know, some of them exploded like little bombs. What? What is wrong with you? Like, that is terrible. Um, and then the children the way they respond is very respectful. They're excited that Strawberry gets to be, um, that he gets to be a talking horse and they go in and talk to them just on their own terms. You know, they're like, yeah. they're kind of large lettuce. That's my belief. No, no, we're not. Honestly, we're not. So Polly hastily, we're not at all nice to eat. They're not like, oh no, you stupid rabbit. Like, no, we're yeah. not that. They talk to them as equals. Right. And it's a very strong contrast between Aslan giving them the animals, this dominion over the dumb beasts the children and Frank treating the talking beasts as their equals, as they're supposed to. And uncle Andrew having the exact opposite reaction and then showing what that does to a person yeah. to, I don't want to say dehumanize, but basically he's dehumanizing them because the talking beasts are kind of human in a sense. D uh, there's just not a good word for it. No, I know, <laughs> what, we know what you mean though. He's dehumanizing them. And therefore that, it creates an impoverishment in his own imagination and eventually in his own ability to even perceive reality. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's almost like because Andrew, you know, himself abused his authority over animals, he expects that as soon as they have the upper hand now, well, what are they going to do but abuse their authority over him? Like he can't fathom a healthy relationship between the two. And usually I would edit out something like Sailor but, coming down the stairs. But Sailor coming down the <laughs> stairs is perfectly so, timed. <laughs> I feel like in this episode it deserves to be there. So <laughs> he also licked my microphone, which I now have to keep about two inches from now. <laughs> It's going to start to really smell. We're well, in this episode now. <laughs> Sarah, what, what you were saying reminded me, this is, it's not a super scientific, it's not considered a scientific experiment. Um, it wasn't very well done, but the Stanley Milgram prison experiments come to mind. And in short, 
some people were um, guards and some people were prisoners. And the people that were treated like prisoners became more and more like prisoners. And the people who were guards started doing worse and worse stuff just because of the roles and the kind of feedback loop that was happening there. And I'm curious if this is what we're seeing with Uncle Andrew, where, you know, he has he has mistreated animals and it's changed him. And now he is perceiving animals differently than he did before. Yeah, Yeah, I think so. I mean, we, I know there have been examples of this in real life. Like, isn't there something where we find out that many serial killers or, you know, people who are violent criminals, you often find out that they abused animals when they were younger, like that they started out with animals. And so if it's kind of like, if you can stand to do something that awful and it's not even a person, then you're Mm -hmm. hardening yourself to do things that are even worse to people who are people. Right. Yeah. You kind of, um, you dull your conscience a little bit each Mm -hmm. time and it becomes more and more acceptable in your mind. Right. That's well said. Well, all of this is exactly where the chapter ends. Um, One of the bulldogs tries to say to Uncle Andrew, like, hey, like, you know, um, what did he say? Are you, he's just asking, are you an animal, vegetable, or mineral? But all Uncle Andrew can hear is, is the growling of the beast, right? And that's exactly where it ends, which is really fun. Which, by the way, as I'm looking at the book here, so many great illustrations of animals. This is, I this think chapter. that, yeah, I think these illustrations are among the best. Yeah, there's ones of some of the creatures created too. I think we have four different illustrations in this chapter, yeah. which are really fun. Any final thoughts here, though? on this chapter before we we kind of close out here there are just a couple of quotes that i want to share um there's a scholarly book called animals in the writings of c.s lewis that i happened Mm. to pick up when it was ten dollars because they were having a black friday sale a couple years ago um normally it's like a hundred and ten dollars because that's what scholarly scholarly stuff does yeah so um, it's not something that I can be like, Hey, everybody, here's the link, go pick it up. Unless you happen to get it at their yearly $10 sale. Um, but it's by Michael Gilmore. And he has also written a book called Eden's other residents, which is a really wonderful book about animal theology, um, and ethics. And so both of these books have obviously been really influential on my work. Mm-hmm. Um, but what the animals in the writings of CS Lewis book does is basically, follow a couple of different topics and just pull quotes or references from everything that we have that C.S. Lewis wrote, including things like from his writings and, you know, the volumes of his letters, sorry, his letters, the volumes of his letters. There are so many. If I were to try to like flip through and be like, let's find one where he talks about animals, that would just take me forever. But he's Mm -hmm. kind of compiled, compiled them all here. Um, Anyway, this quote, I think, fits with what we're talking about. So it's from a letter to Evelyn Underhill. And he says, obviously, in response to something that she had shared, I do know what you mean by the sudden ravishing glimpse of animal life in itself, its wildness, to meet a squirrel in a pod, I'm not sure what he means by that, or even a hedgehog in the garden makes me happy. But that is because it is being partly exempt from the fall, a symbol and reminder of the unfallen world we long for. The wildness would not be lost by the kind of dominion Adam had. So this is going back to his ideas on paradisal man. It would be nicer, not less nice, if that squirrel would come and make friends with me at my whistle. Still more, if he would obey him, if he would obey me when I told him not to kill the red squirrel in the next tree. I don't envisage the taming of all beasts as involving domestication of all, only perhaps the dog and a few others. This is my favorite part. In a paradisal state, if you wanted a horse to ride, you would walk up to the nearest herd and ask for volunteers, and the one you chose would be regarded as the lucky one. Hmm, interesting yeah so that goes back to and he mentions um animals being partly exempt from the fall which is part of his really interesting ideas of um the order of creation he had some some evolutionary beliefs that animals were around for quite some time not just a day um, before Mm -hmm. humans were around and that in some way satan got in and corrupted them before the fall of adam and eve and that that's where predation comes from um I think that's a little complicated. (laughs) That's just Lewis's idea, but that's where he's coming from when he says animals being partly exempt from the fall. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think he's meaning like they're, um, they're not 
needing atonement the way that humans are interested yeah atonement. yeah where does some of that writing come from do you know like where he wrote it was it just in letters or so that was in a letter to evelyn yeah. underhill Those um other thoughts but the part about the animals that's from pro the problem of pain and maybe okay, a little bit okay. in miracles but i think it's mostly from the problem of pain okay okay yeah um so yeah i just i think that's sort of appropriate yeah, so what we were talking about the idea of just going up to to a herd of wild horses and being like you i need a ride and they'd be like yes oh please pick me i just love that mm -hmm. yeah. um and then another theme that uh, michael gilmore points out all the way through in this book is that a return to eden is apparent in everything that lewis writes especially in relation to animals that there's something about animals that makes lewis not just in Narnia, uh, but makes Lewis sort of long for Eden or long for the new earth. Um, and this is related to the horse and his boy. I thought this was really interesting um, since you guys just finished that season. So when they're, he's talking about when they get to the Hermit of the Southern March, the story of Shasta and Erebus's arrival to the Hermitage is a reversal of Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. The children leave their wilderness wanderings and enter a place of beauty where there is reverence for Narnia's creator and obedience to divine rule. Lewis seems to stress the absence of animals or at least welcome animals in the one space and their presence in the other. So that's a quote from Michael Gilmore. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it all kind of goes together in that in this chapter, we get Lewis's ideas on how humans and animals should interact given to us yeah, some yeah. with how the children are interacting with the animals, but also how Aslan tells the talking beasts to interact with the dumb beasts. And also what Lewis longs to be true about what Eden was like, and therefore maybe what the new earth will be like. And he kind of pictures that in his writings, both in Paralandra and in The Magician's Nephew. And it's, it's a cool way to get into his longings, his desire and the Zane Zucht, like what that looks like for him and that animals are such a big part of it mm -hmm. um, has always inspired me. Not always the last three years, very inspired. Me. Yeah. That is, that's really cool. I'm glad you shared both of those because to me, it, whenever I do feel that longing, it, it makes me wonder why is that there? And it's exciting to know that that is going to be there, but it's also cool to see someone else's version of that longing to perhaps get a glimpse of what else might be there. I can't even imagine all the wonderful stuff that there will be, um, but there's there's even more to it than what my brain can handle. Right, and I think even for somebody, Daniel, like your wife who's allergic, or you who might just not necessarily want the pet in your house, it still can be appealing to think like, what could it be like when like the allergies are gone, and when mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about sweeping the floor that the you know the dirt that the dog drug in um when you don't have to worry about those things how much joy is set before us that we can mm -hmm. look forward to about the creation that god has made and that he will i mean we know from isaiah that there will be animals in the new earth so don't know exactly how that will work but they're going to be there and what can we look forward to and well, i think lewis gives us a good idea i think god's going to sing a song and make them on the spot i was gonna ask if there gonna be any new kind of animals will yeah. like in in the new earth will there be animals that don't exist on earth they're like this is a tiger with eight heads <laughs> <laughs> well blaze is really hoping that he will get to see all the dinosaurs oh, in the cool. new earth he talks yeah. about that all the time um <laughs> and just as an aside i really love that he thinks about the new earth as something that is truly coming like that, that mm -hmm. he's growing up with that as like this is going to happen. I just have to wait for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's always talking about like, oh, I wonder, maybe we'll figure out the answer to that question in the new earth. Where did the dinosaurs go? What happened to them? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got to add the Bermuda Triangle, a couple of things you got like, here's on my list as soon oh, as I, I get there. I think everybody. Uh, St. Peter, you're like, hey, I need, I got some questions. I have a big list. Oh, really? What's, oh, yeah. what's some of the ones on your list? Basically anything that is um, not completely 100% for sure solved. Like any no, anything like, that has examples. enough room for conspiracy. Give, give enough examples. You have nothing. Every single assassination, including the dinosaurs. <laughs> the, the dinosaurs <laughs> were assassinated. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. There was a book that we got the from shorts. the library about dinosaurs, 
it was a kid's book and at the yeah, end yeah. it had like a little quiz about you know like what was the dinosaur that lived in this habitat blah blah mm-hmm. and the, there's a question at the end that said what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs it was like a b c or d and the answer that the book had given was an asteroid fell mm-hmm. whatever and then one of the answers was the uprising of the mammals <laughs> oh the mammal uprising so blaze basically lost his mind was laughing unable to breathe for many minutes and mentioned it over and over again yeah. so the uprising of the mammals is clearly something that happened phil you're onto something you're gonna <laughs> ask about it so you're gonna ask about uh well like lincoln isn't that's that's not a conspiracy do you think he's still alive no, I don't. But you're going to ask about JFK. You're going to be like, what, what was happening there? Yeah, I mean, that, that one's kind of an obvious one. But just like any, like, I want to know, like, hey, like, do you remember that, like, cool, like, tech deck skateboard I had? And then, like, it suddenly disappeared. Like, <laughs> where did it go? Where did it go? Did, did, did I lose it or did my mom donate it? I actually, this is a good one. I, so just last fall, the week before school started, I lost my car keys. You lost all your keys. I lost all no all of my keys and your marbles, I, right? I, lo- <laughs> I the lost I lost all the of entire them. collection. I lost all of them. We had to get new like key. I had to get like a new. I couldn't get my car because we didn't have the extra key. We had to get like all new locks on our doors, everything. And I still don't know where they could have possibly gone. I lost them while at school, and there were no kids the, during that week. Like it was the week before kids came back. I don't know where they went to, and I'm gonna be like, God, where? Where, Where did keys? those keys go? I'm okay now. I've moved on. I just want to know what happened to them. These yeah. are the questions that everyone has on their list. Yeah. That we yeah. need to know what happened. Your list? Oh, not that I can think of. Okay. Where Where are the things that I used to be able to call to mind immediately, and now they've yeah. all completely disappeared because of COVID or because of age? Yeah. yeah. Where did my favorite shirt go? I wore it all the time, and then it was gone. Or like, depending on when when we go, I want to be like, how close were we? Like scientifically, how close? was this like why do we know this but we couldn't figure out this other stuff like how close were we to like solving can't like like curing yeah like were something? we close or was like, like you guys was... were really close in the 80s and then you messed up and it's you've been going the whole the wrong direction forever yeah. or something you know yeah because you started focusing on big data and stuff like, yeah well, like something where do like we go that. wrong oh my goodness yeah this is wild <laughs> A Bermuda Triangle when I was in fifth grade I remember going home to my parents I'd go to that section in the library get like Bermuda Triangle Loch Ness Monster and stuff and like I remember saying to it wasn't it was like asking my parents or something and like can I can I ask like is that reverent can I ask God about the Loch Ness Monster when we get there it might have been my sister it might have been someone else some other young one person in the house like a cousin or something I think it was probably Emily though was like God doesn't care about that he's not gonna want to answer that question for you and we'd be like what what if I really want to know about the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> Blaze prayed that at our family prayers the other night, not about the Loch Ness Monster, though he is interested in that because it might have been a plesiosaur. Um, But um, I love that you knew that. (laughs) (laughs) You can always tell that someone has kids by how well they pronounce a dinosaur's name. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Um, At the beach a couple weeks ago, he wanted to get a stuffed animal as a souvenir. And for some reason, like the beach gift shop had a plesiosaur stuffed animal. And he was like, yes, this is what I want to remember my time at the beach. Anyway, um, but we asked him like, do you want to pray for something? Is there a concern that you have? And he prayed and he said, God, will you please help us know what happened to the dinosaurs? (laughs) Oh, this was before the uprising of the mammals was on. Yeah, he had had learned about that. Oh, the yeah. other option in that quiz was the explosion of the moon, which we all know, of course, took place. Huh. Yeah, the backup moon. Well, the first one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, but everybody knew that. Do you expl- know, the, we used to have two moons. The first one exploded. It all hit actually, uh, the, the real moon, and now that's why there's craters on it. They all came from the old moon. No, I can connect all this for you. Do you know where the moon came from? The, the leading theory is that the Earth got hit really hard by something, and a chunk of it flew out and became the moon. Okay. So... Took out also the dinosaurs, that, made yeah. the moon. Oh, okay. Interesting. No, they were at different stages. <laughs> All right. Well, any, any, uh, this is great. Any final thoughts here? We're going to skip listener feedback just because we've had such a great conversation here. And we got to talk about a lot of other fun yeah, things. I just glanced at our, our, um, our little audio recorder tells us how long we've been recording and it, it says flew four by. Hours. <laughs> huh? It says four hours. It says, yeah, four hours. No, it, uh, it says an so hour if, 18. If it's not four hours for by. y'all, it means we edited out a lot of what Sarah said. 
<laughs> she, no, I'm just kidding. It was totally just me. We edited out everything that I said. We, we um, Daniel has this like this wonderful stuff in the middle. Like he gets wound up, and then he says the stuff in the middle, and then he edits the the stuff around. Yeah, yeah. Each side. Well, well, Sarah. Next time that Phil and I are back, we're going to be covering chapter eleven, which is Diggory and his uncle are both in trouble. But before we sign off, I would love to point listeners in any kind of direction where they can follow you or um, read anything that you're up to. Where, where can listeners get to know you a little bit better? Well, unlike Phil and Daniel, who are very holy and who are not on social media very much, I am on Twitter <laughs> all the time. Um, so you can find me there, Sarah E. Cozart. Um, and Cozart is spelled like Mozart, but with a C at the beginning. And I talk about all sorts of stuff. And then <clears throat> I have an Instagram. It's also Sarah E. Cozart. I don't do as much on there, but I also have one for Luthien and it's Luthien Ooh. the Aussie. Um, I don't do as much on there as I used to. I had a, <laughs> I had a 2000 follower Instagram for Baron that was called Baron Von Cozy because Cozart was the last name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and the reason that I no longer do as much with the pet one is right when blaze was born baron's instagram took a big hit <laughs> and no longer was i you know narrating pictures of what my dog might be thinking but i was now doing it with a baby mm -hmm. but i do have um you can go look at silly pictures of my dogs and stuff from there but twitter is really the place that i'm the most active okay. great great thanks for sharing as always sarah just like last time it is a huge pleasure to have you on the show this is so great. We love hearing your thoughts, especially this is a place. This is the perfect you're, chapter. For yeah, you're too, really just, passionate about this. And I think you that it, had you not, yeah, had you not been with us, I think a lot of this great conversation just would not have happened. Well, thank you so I much. I don't like pets, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining in. Yeah. You want me to yeah. wrap this up here? Yeah, well, Phil, why don't you go ahead and wrap us up? This episode is made possible by our patrons over at patreon.com. If you'd like to support the show, you too can listen to a bonus episode each month, along with other rewards. Special thanks goes to Hannah Anderson, John Marr, Emily Wakefield, and Ryan Smith for supporting us at our top tiers. Listener feedback can be sent to thenarniapodcast at gmail.com, and voicemails can be left at 406-646-6733. A review on Apple Podcasts would also be appreciated. Thanks for coming along on this journey, and we will be back next time with Chapter 11.